I'm Stephen Ben Danoon, and you're watching Danoon Institute of Biblical Research, a production of IsraelReturns.com. In behind me here is the city of Beit Shean. Beit Shean is a city with tremendous historical significance and biblical significance as well. We find here that Beit Shean, it was, it's been ruled by many people down through the ages, long before uh, King David's time. Uh, we had the Egyptians that ruled here, the Philistines actually ruled here, and David himself overthrew the city after Saul's death and ruled here for some time as well. And then finally the hand of the Romans had this city as well, and it came to its end. It was burned to the ground and finally an earthquake destroyed the city and it became uninhabited. Now, in this city, the, the, the significance, it, it, it really, when I come here to Beit Shean, and I've been here many times in the past, it is like a memorial for me. It's very, it's very deep in my heart because I always remember what happened here from the book of Samuel. In the first book of Samuel, near the end of the, the book itself, around the 31st chapter, is when we find out about Beit Shean. When Saul and his sons, Jonathan, uh, mainly Jonathan, but we also, we know that his son, uh, Abinadab and Malachishu, they died in battle not far from where Beit Shean is, at Mount Giboa. This is where they died in battle when the Philistines were pursuing and Saul, the battle did not go well with him. He was wounded by an archer. And Saul was wanting to have his armor bearer kill him so that they would not abuse him. But when his armor bearer feared, he actually feared God is what it was because he knew that Saul was the anointed of God. So he refused to kill him. So Saul fell on his own sword to his own peril. And then his armor bearer, when he saw that he was dead, he did in like manner. Later we find out, though, there's a young man, an Amalekite, that comes up and brings the crown of Saul and Saul's bracelet unto David, his head covered in, sackcloth, or covered in sackcloth and his head in ashes. And he comes and bows before David to bring the message of Saul's death and Jonathan's death. David inquired of this armor, or this Amalekite and asked him, how did he know? And in his story, he tells that when he came upon Saul, he fell on his sword, but he was not dead yet. And Saul begged of him to take his life. And the Amalekite claimed that he killed him. So he'd brought David the, the crown, thinking that David would be pleased by the gesture that he had done. It makes me think of the scripture where the Bible says, the time will come where they think they, that they kill you, that they do God's pleasure, or they do God a service by killing you. Just like we've seen with the Jews down through the ages. See, Saul is a type of Israel. He's a type of Israel that was unable to recognize Mashiach when Mashiach came. Israel, 2,000 years ago, was unable to recognize that Yeshua was indeed Mashiach, that he was the king of Israel. Much like Saul was unable to recognize that when David was anointed as king by Samuel the prophet, that indeed God had chose him for that purpose. So instead, an evil spirit come upon him and a jealousy spirit. And he sought David's life continually. And although David could have killed Saul, in fact, at En Gedi, when we took you there to En Gedi, the very place where David was hiding from Saul, and then Saul sought relentlessly to take David's life. God put Saul and his men into a deep sleep and David was able to creep in, creep in and he cut the corner of his garment. His own men said to him, why not take his life? This is the hand. God has delivered your enemy into your, your hand. And David said, far be it from me to touch God's anointed. See, as much wrong and as, as far off as what Saul was, David knew that he was the anointed of God and that he would not dare touch him just like it is with Israel today. Israel is the anointed of God. Although when we look upon the Jewish people that are here in Israel and the Jewish people around the world, they may not seem anointed to many people, but they are. And just because they do not recognize who Mashiach really is, who the Messiah really is, the son of David as the scripture calls it, it doesn't mean that they're any less anointed. 
In fact, in this story here, when the Malachite comes and tells about the, the death of, um, of Saul and Jonathan, it ends up to be into his own peril. Because then what it does is it angers David. When David finds out that, that Saul has been killed and that this man, he comes up there. Now, to give you a little bit of background on the story, what happens is the Philistines are, are at war with Saul and, and Israel and his armies there, Saul and his men. And they had, they were going, the battle was going very much against Saul up at Mount Geboa, uh, Geboa which is not far from here, from Beit Shean. And in the course of the battle, Saul's sons were killed, all three of them. Jonathan, which was the dearly beloved of David, was also killed by a sword. Saul was hit by an, by an archer, one of the bowmen of the Philistines, and he was wounded badly. And he didn't want the Philistines to, to make sport of him while he was dying, so he took, when his own armor bearer refused to take, he was too fearful to kill him. Why? Because he knew that he was the anointed of God. So Saul falls on his own sword and dies, and the armor bearer does likewise. Now, oddly enough, when this Amalekite comes and tells David about the story, and yet he's in sackcloth and ashes and mourning the, the death of Saul, David asked him the question, were you not afraid? to take the life of God's anointed. But yet this man thought he had done God a favor. In fact, there's a scripture that clearly says, the time will come, they will think they do God's service to kill you. And that's exactly what has happened to the Jewish people for the last 2,000 years. It's not to say that there's not many good Christian people. There are many, many, by the thousands and tens of thousands of Christians that love Israel, that stand with Israel, and we thank God for every one of them that are like that. But for every true Christian that stands with Israel, there are still many more than the righteous that stand against Israel. Those were the ones that participated when Pope Pius the 12th took Hitler, helped him into power to kill the Jews during what is called the Holocaust. The pogroms, Stalin, Mussolini, all of these have been the murderers. They have been the Amalekites thinking to be the friend of David. In other words, thinking that they are friends with Christ, Mashiach. And in fact, when they go across the border thinking that they have done God a great service and they go before Yeshua, they will say, did we not do a great service? They were your enemy, my Lord. And we did you a favor and killed them. But as we see the anger of David as he raises up against this Amalekite and says, you did not fear to touch God's anointed. And then David had a young man fall upon him and kill him that very moment. You see, we forget, even David, in the story when Absalom and his son who also failed to recognize that David was the anointed of God of his day. His own son, his very name should have told him. His name means, my father is peace, Absalom, or Absalom, as we say in English. He failed to recognize who his father was as well. And yet David was only typing out who Mashiach was, who Yeshua actually really would be. His whole life displays beautifully that Jesus indeed was the Messiah. How could we, have, as Jewish people, how could we have missed this? When David takes his self and he, and he crosses over the Kidron Valley there in Jerusalem and he goes up onto the Mount of Olives and he weeps over Jerusalem and he says, how often I would have hovered you as a hen with her own brood. He and his men go up with their heads covered. No wonder why we wear kippahs to this day. God has us, everything about us, we're in mourning. When we cover our heads, we are in mourning. Not even realizing that we have crucified our own Messiah. Now David could have rose up. He still had very valiant men. Although David was aged, he had very valiant men that were fighters, that were willing to fight and to put down the rebellion of, 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 of Solomon. And I used to think it kind of strange, you know, because I think to myself, you know, well, 
why, especially when David, when Absalom is killed and he mourns him so badly and he says, I wish to God that I could have died instead of you, my son. And his own men became very upset with him that he did this. And they said, you bring to a shame. He wasn't bringing to a shame. He was displaying who Mashiach really would be. The thing is, though, is what Yeshua could do, David could not do. See, remember, Peter rose up when they came after Yeshua and smote the servant, the servant of the high priest's ears off. And Yeshua stopped him and said, put away your sword. He said, could I not call ten legions of angels just now if I so wanted to be delivered? But this isn't, wasn't why he came. But his men were going to fight for him. They would have been gladly to fight. And God would have delivered Israel into their hands. Just like God would have delivered David and would have given up Solomon to his hand. He would have killed him and put down the rebellion with no problem. But that's not what David does. Like Christ, he crosses that Kidron Valley, weeps over Jerusalem, and it's written in the Christian Bible that Yeshua does the same. Wept over Jerusalem and said, How often I would have hovered you as a hen would her own brood, but you would not. He said, your house is left to you desolate until you say, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. What, is, what house is he talking about? Well, we do know that there should be a third temple built because it's prophecy. But he's actually talking about their heart. The very human heart that he come to fill with the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God, the waters of life, when he was on the cross, his side was pierced, and that water came out of his side, separated from his blood, was to show us as Jews that he was the rock that Moses smote back 1,500 years beforehand. He was that rock. And the water coming from his side was only testifying that he was split, that he had been smitten, and that he was the waters of life that actually flowed in the Garden of Eden, that actually Adam and Eve were filled with that same spirit of Almighty God, the Eitz Chaim, from the Tree of Life. He was, Yeshua was that tree of life. But he said to Israel, your house. Now it wasn't those that were believing. It wasn't the apostles that followed. It wasn't the Gentiles that ended up receiving him gladly. But your house will be less to, left to you desolate. Your heart, in other words. Bait Levi. The house of your heart is left desolate. Until you say, Bahu haba Adonai. Blessed is he that comes in the name Adonai, Basham Yeshua HaMashiach, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's when, you're, that's when your house will be filled. When you recognize that he was the rock, he is the rock, and in him is the Eitz Chaim living inside of him, and that that life was imparted. All we have to do, my brethren, is to say, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. As soon as it touches our lips and our hearts, he is obligated to fill us with the Holy Ghost. That very life, that's all that we're waiting on. And this story of David and Saul, and Saul and Jonathan's bodies that hung on this very city, that became a Roman city later. There's so many hidden things in this story here. This is why David mourned Absalom's death so greatly. Just as Yeshua wept over Jerusalem. Now Jesus, though, was able to do what, what David could not do. He did take Israel's place. He took Absalom's place and he gave his life that they would not lose theirs. Although they went down to the dust as martyrs, there's still that beautiful scripture that says, in both in Ezekiel as well as in Revelation, in the book of Revelation, it says, how long, O oh Lord, till you avenge the blood of those that took our lives? That's paraphrased, of course. It's in the fifth seal. And as well in Ezekiel, they were dry bones, valleys full of dry bones, Jews that had been murdered just because they were Jews. And they said, our hope is lost. All of our hope is lost. But God, in His mercy said to the prophet Ezekiel, can these bones live again? Yes, they can. Yes, they can. And we're living in the hour now when soon God will call and those bones will come to life just as Ezekiel saw. 
and saw the anointed of God. He was gathered with Samuel, just as Samuel had prophesied earlier. Didn't tell you about that part, but I know many of you know that story already. He does go to the witch of Endor, but the scripture plainly says that it was Saul that came up. And Saul does prophesy to him and says, By tomorrow this time you and your sons will be with me. The next day they fell in battle, but not from the memory of Almighty God. It's amazing. In this remarkable city, beautiful city, the city of cruelty, other than when it was under the hands of David. I'm Stephen Benjanoon. You're watching the Noon Institute of Biblical Research, a production of IsraelReturns.com. Thank you, and thank you for watching. Thank you for your support. So much of what you do and what you give towards this ministry is what makes these moments possible. If you'd like to contribute, IsraelReturns.com. Thank you again, and God bless.